Let's have prayer. God, please send forth laborers into your harvest. I thank you that people around the world got to hear <coughs> that song. Lord, I pray that the people around them might hear the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for this time. None of us are going to be beaten for being in chapel. We're not going to be beheaded. We're not going to be paraded around with hoods on our heads and forced to say things in the name of another God. Thank you for the freedom we have to be in this place this morning. Lord, I, I think of the fellow, Brother Reyes, who texts me occasionally when he sees these online or on, on the Facebook, and he says, will you come and teach us in our country? And other times he said, can I come learn in your Bible college? God, thank you for the privilege we have to be in this room this morning. They want that privilege. Thank you for what we have. Even though there's final exams next week. But thank you for the privilege. God, use us today in chapel. And I thank you for what we're going to see about what you did in our country in the past. And now, uh, God, please bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Finkhart. Let's stand, take our songbook, Psalm 542. Psalm 542, the family of God. We'll stand and scare the first of the month. Psalm 542.
today we're going to do something special. I try to do this every year in chapel, but maybe I didn't do it last year. Uh, because uh, Brother Fankart said he wasn't sure he remembered this. He might remember it, he's not sure he remembers it. Uh, but I try to do it, and, and uh, I'm excited about it. It's part of my Baptist history class, and I'm excited about Baptist history. Um, the, uh, we'll get into that, though, in just a second. Um, the, this is Friday, right? Before you leave today, next hour, we'll have your exam schedule out. And uh, if you are not current on your bill, you need to come and tell me when you will be so that you can take your exam. Uh, and then we'll, we'll decide about that and uh, work with you if we can. Uh, also, uh, we got the promise, and I shared the promise with you, and I'm bringing it up on Facebook Live because it might encourage somebody else to, to say thank you, Lord. Because a lot of people text me aside or mostly they personal message me. They don't want their comments out there for everybody to see. But they'll say, we're praying for the college, Brother Miller. We're praying for the students. We're praying for the Victory Fund. Uh, how many of you, after yesterday when we did the math and found out that if we were to charge you what it cost you to train you, it would cost another $5,000. That means your tuition would go from about 7000 to 12000 How many of you would prefer to pay the 5000 extra after that? How many of you are glad that we're not charging you the 5000 But that puts a burden on me, Bruce Miller. And some of you assume that burden by being in the music groups. When you sing in churches, how many of you have ever heard a preacher say or a church treasurer say, Brother Miller, do I make this check out to you or to the college? How many of you have ever heard that? And what do I say? Make it out to the college. See? And uh, what am I doing? I'm investing in your education. But what are you doing? You're investing in your education, right? You're, tra you're, you're saying, uh, I'm not getting paid for this. Well, in one sense, you are a little bit. Because every time you're out, money goes off your tuition for the next semester. And if you're out for the summer, money goes, a lot of money goes off your tuition. If you're out for six weeks in the summer. Uh, so you are getting paid a little bit, but uh, the rest of the money of that offering doesn't go to me. It goes to the college, and it goes to the Victory Fund. So you have a part in helping to raise that Victory Fund. Thank you so much. I will tell you this, in all honesty, ordinarily, if I was an egotist, I wouldn't tell you this. Ordinarily, I get better offerings for the college when the men's group and the ladies' group are out than when I'm going to out by myself. The only thing they want to give me money for then is if I won't sing. Brother Miller, if you won't sing, we'll be good. No. So, uh, thank you so much for your part in it. But, I said all that because of the Facebook Live people. Maybe you all understood that. I probably shouldn't have had to go through that for you. Uh, but, um, a lot of them are praying. And yesterday we said that 6,000 was on the way. Uh, 2,000 was on the way. 8,000 total. And the 6000 came in, and I gave a check to Pastor White for the rent for March, April, May. Otherwise, we wouldn't have heat in this building, uh, water in this building, and so forth. We wouldn't have space in this building. Looking back at the library, uh, we pay for that space. So, uh, I gave him a check this morning, and he, he uh, informed me, now you're ahead, because one of it was for May. It's been a long time. Students and praying friends since we've been ahead on our rent. What a blessing to be ahead. And then uh, we have $2,000 to go toward uh, some of our staff being paid today. And I'm so thankful for that. Now, we're getting ready to send out a letter. And uh, what is that figure? Do you have that in your hand, Brother Minkar? What's left? Well, of the 71000 that we needed originally, what do we need yet to pay the school bills for training these students here? $13,839. we are down to 13000 13000 How many of you are grateful that we're not charging you the 5000 Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Well, then would you help us out? He's, he's working on this. And would you fold them and stuff them so we can get them out and stamp them? Would you do that? Uh, what do we have yet to do, uh, Mrs. Black? You did a lot of it. Katie, you did a lot of it. Thank you. What do we have yet to do? Just uh, fold and stuff and stamp. Fold and stuff and stamp. So, uh, 
how many of you can next hour or a little bit this afternoon, so Brother Finkhart can take him over to the post office later this afternoon, how many of you can help out sometime? All right, good, good. Remember, it's your training we're paying for. That's right. It's your training we're paying for. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with new property, new building next year. This is your training that we're paying for. Brother Connell told me the other day, you need to raise your tuition. How can you do this? Have you figured on that yet? All right, get your Bibles and turn to John 14, 6. And Brother uh, Tim, you're singing for us today? Well, let's hear it, man. Lord bless you.
And they're independent fundamental Baptist preachers who don't. But the Bible talks about heretics, people who have the truth and turn from it. And the Bible says a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. That has more to do with a heretic in our circles, in our church, uh, a heretic teaching one of our adult Sunday school classes, something like that. But the Bible does talk about not only that, but exposing false prophets. That has to do with people who teach con things contrary to the Word of God. Now, it is a fact, no doubt about it. Uh, I'm not talking about maybe a priest here and a nun here who may believe that you're saved by trusting Christ and Christ alone is your salvation. It is a fact that the Roman Catholics, in their doctrine, in their catechism, that they teach everybody who's going to become a, a confirmed Catholic, before they can take Holy Communion, they have to go through their catechism and they have to go through the confirmation process. They're taught uh, to not only trust Christ, but trust other deities or partial deities, like Mary. They're taught to pray. Uh, Hail Mary, Mother of God. And then it gets down to the end. Remember us now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Now the Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Right. You don't go to Mary. You don't go to Dr. Miller. You don't go to the Pope. Uh, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. They also are taught in this confirmation process that they have to maintain certain works. And they have to take Holy Communion. And when they sin, they have to confess their sins. Well, Brother Miller, don't we believe that? Yes, but we believe that differently. We believe we have to confess our sin to God. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Notice who, who we're confessing to. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There are some preachers, unfortunately, who believe the sin has to be confessed to them. Uh, I know a pastor one time who, a man in his church, this was over in Pennsylvania, went to him and said, I committed such and such a sin. I, for some reason, I feel like I should tell you, pastor. Uh, he said later, boy, that was a mistake. I said, why? He said, well, I told him, and he said, well, you need to confess this to God. And I said, I already have, and I'm forgiven. forgiven. And he said, well, we're going to bring you up before the church for church discipline. Mm -hmm. For a sin that this guy had already taken to God and been forgiven of. He hadn't stolen money from the church, so it, it wasn't like he had to make restitution or something. And he took that man up before the church, and it just almost destroyed his teenage children. Mm -hmm. How sad. Private sin, private confession. Public sin, public confession. That's the Bible way. Yeah. You don't go to articular confession, a priest in a booth, who will tell you what you have to do to be forgiven. Say X number of Hail Marys. Go through your rosary X number of times. What, what did we see yesterday about the grace of God? For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works. Hail Marys are works. The rosary is works. And then he'll also tell you to light so many candles and so forth. And then he'll tell you that your sins are absolved. Your, God bless you, my sons. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, you don't go through a priest to get to God. Look at Christ's clear statement here. I already quoted several times. One God, one mediator. Look here in John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, not a way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I said all that to say this. We send missionaries to Mexico. We send missionaries to Brazil. We send missionaries to other countries where Catholicism is the main religion. Because if you believe what the Catholics teach about being saved, if there's a Catholic watching, uh, uh, study, ask your priest, what must I do to be saved? How can I know for sure I'm on my way to heaven? Ask your priest that. If he tells you anything other than trusting Christ as your Savior, then uh, that's not biblical. And I'm saying all that to say this. There was a time when the Roman Catholic Church had as its design uh, to uh, Catholicize with missionaries the whole world. 
No, I don't blame them for that. Don't we have the same goal for Christianity? Now, they say they're Christian, but I make a difference. Uh, because we believe our salvation is in Christ, not in Mary. In Christ, not in the church. So I don't blame them for that. Isn't our, that our goal too? Yeah. To uh, evangelize the world? Yes, it is. I don't blame them for that. But if our country today was Catholic predominantly, some of us would not be saved. We got the gospel from people who got the gospel, from people who got the gospel, from early settlers who were born again Christians. But the Catholics had a plan. They had all South America. Every nation in South America is predominantly Catholic. They had all Central America. Every nation in Central America is predominantly Catholic. In fact, some of those countries say in their constitutions that the country religion is Catholicism. They say that. And so... Uh, they, that was their plan to uh, Catholicize the world. They sent out missionaries. Their missionaries were priests and nuns. And they would set up mission stations in different places. And uh, they would have those mission stations. And then they would try to reach American Indians or settlers from those stations. Uh, they usually were named after a saint. Have you ever heard of St. Paul, Minnesota? St. Louis. Missouri. Those started as mission stations in the Catholic Church. You go down to Louisiana, it's Saint, 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 Saint in some of those towns. And uh, uh, they don't have counties there, they have parishes. And the parishes were set up by the Catholic Church in Louisiana when Louisiana uh, belonged to the French. Is that right? The French. And uh, the French had strong Catholicism. To our north, they had a plan. And Quebec, the province of Quebec, they speak French, and it's mainly Roman Catholic. They were succeeding in their plan. But the people who settled on the Atlantic coast of our country came from mainly, not solely, but mainly England. And they came mainly, not solely, but they came mainly for freedom of religion, to worship the Bible. Uh, I'm sorry, to worship Christ and, and study the Bible and uh, uh, worship God as they believe the Bible dictated in their life, their understanding of the Bible. That's what I meant to say, not worship the Bible. And, uh, uh, but something changed. That, it was going good. Christianity's there. Christianity spread through Schubel Stern, started 47 churches and sent out a hundred and what? hundred... 20 something they, they started 120 some uh, churches uh, sent 120 some preachers and uh, uh, those men and a few men from the church a few families would uproot their homes and move to another place and move right into a community just the pastor and his wife didn't go there the, the missionary he went there with several believing families and they would start churches that started churches so to say uh, whatever it is, 147 or 120 some churches that they started. That figure is low because their churches they started started churches. And they started churches. <laughs> they moved up north, back north to Virginia. They were in North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, they, they moved over into uh, uh, Maryland, uh, what is now West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana. Ohio, Christianity, Bible Christianity was spread. By the way, this is fact, not Baptist fiction. Daniel Boone and his brother, I think his name was Squire Boone, but I'm not sure about that. They were born again Christians. And when they traveled to their settlements, there's a whole bunch of states that have Boonesboro. <laughs> Daniel Boone lived here. No, Daniel Boone lived here. He lived in a lot of them. As he traveled west, uh, they, they evangelized as they went, even though they weren't primarily preachers. But uh, then in 1803, our country bought, bought a chunk of land, 1,179,000 1, square miles known as the Louisiana Purchase. And that was already being settled by the Catholics. Settlement of that area was slow. And hard due to some people who lived there and didn't want us taking their land away. They were called the Indians. 
You know, we think of the savage Indians. No wonder they were mad. We were taking their land from them, you see. And uh, uh, so settlement was slow. But the American Baptist Home Mission Society sent out a man named Jonathan Peck. And Jonathan Peck was a Congregationalist, but then he became a Baptist, and he got licensed uh, by the Baptist to preach in 1812. He was burdened for home missions, and he was burdened for this land west of the Mississippi. And he was sent to go to west of the Mississippi. In his first three years, listen to this, he organized several churches and 50 schools. What's important about schools? Training the children, bringing them up in the way they should go. And the other missions. And he helped support Reverend Isaac McCoy, who was a missionary to the Indians. Now, the Calvinist Baptist opposed, opposed Jonathan Peck and Isaac McCoy. The Calvinists always oppose missions because they believe that those who will be saved are going to be saved, doesn't matter what we do either way or don't do. Remember that, fellows especially, if you're ever flirting with Calvinism. It will kill the evangelism in your church and all around your church and your church mission program. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, uh, they dropped. They dropped the support of these missionaries, the Calvinist Baptists did. In 1820. And uh, this man started works. Get this. In Illinois, Indiana, and Missouri. And then he saw, he came back east to this part of the, of the country. And went from church to church to church. And sought support to take the gospel even farther west. Because our settlements were moving farther west. He started a seminary in Rock Spring, Illinois. And this seminary was to train preachers, sort of like Atlantic Coast Baptist College, to train preachers and their wives. He authored a newspaper that he started in 1829. Brother Pankhart, you like news, newspapering? He authored a newspaper called The Pioneer. And uh, he would tell about planting seasons, new seed that worked real good, seed that didn't work good in certain areas, uh, cattle prices. You say, well, what's that have to do with missions? He also would publish sermons in that newspaper. And for some of those people, they didn't even have churches in their communities yet. And they loved to get that newspaper. It not only told them when to plant the corn, when to plant their lima beans, but it also had the Word of God in there. That would be sort of like the Sword of the Lord today, except bigger. Because the uh, Sword of the Lord's great. But we have other means of getting the Word of God today, too. There were no other means. There's no radio preachers, television preachers. There's no radio or television. And uh, his, his paper, The Pioneer, uh, would be put on stagecoaches and trains and sent all over uh, as, as the expansion of our country moved west. He got, I like this guy's name, he got a helper named Jonathan Going. G-O-I-N-G. That's a good name for a... Uh, a Christian who's going to be obedient, isn't it? Somebody said, uh, we need to put the go back in the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so Jonathan going uh, helped him. And the two of them started the American Baptist Home Mission Society in 1832. It began work in the Mississippi Valley where the Catholics had hoped to take control. Uh, it organized the Illinois Education Society to start more schools. They didn't have public schools back then. If somebody came to start a school in your community, uh, you had a school. If they didn't, you didn't have a school for your kids. And uh, they might start a school, and the teacher might do it on a love offering only basis. So one day, kid brings a pig in, teacher's got food. Another day brings eggs in, teacher's got food. They might pay the teacher a tiny bit, uh, and, and that's how public education uh, got started. Uh, but they started education for the Indians and for the non-Indians, and they started the Alton Seminary and Shirtliff College and many churches and many missions. And the Baptist cause in the Midwest, and the Midwest is part of the Bible Belt, you start in 
uh, Iowa and Missouri and Indiana and go. Oh, yeah, I'm in Iraq. This is the East Coast. And uh, go to Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. That's what's known as the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt. And in the Midwest, the Baptist cause owes, as is the, its existence, to Jonathan Peck. One man that God used in, with his helper, Going and Isaac McCoy, that God used in such a great way. He died in 1856. Now his society, see if, if you ever heard of any of these places. These were little communities of several thousand people at the time. But his society started churches in Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Omaha, Denver, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Hey, we're talking about St. Louis, St. Paul. San means saint also. San Francisco, Portland, statewide, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Texas, Colorado, Kansas, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Montana, California, Oregon, Washington. In the far west, there were men like Fisher and Reed and Johnson and Wheeler who did the first Baptist work in that area. Now, had these people not been obedient to the gospel, taken the gospel to not only the Native Americans, but the people moving into these areas. The Catholics had the plane. They had their mission stations. San, San Bispo, California. I mean, all the sands. San Diego, San Francisco. They had all the mission stations. We would be doing this when we pray and eat, you see, or however you do it. I did it wrong. I don't know. I, I just haven't practiced it. Very much. We would be trusting in Mary in the hour of our death. Everybody you've led to Jesus, if you lived out there in the Midwest, would have been led to Catholicism. We can thank God for our Baptist heritage and our Baptist history. Amen. Now, I want to come back east. In fact, I want to go back into the 1700s. The revolution, the Declaration of Independence had been signed. The Revolutionary War had been fought and won. England surrendered what we know as the original colonies to be the colonies. We had a very loose government under something called the Articles of Confederation. It wasn't working. We needed a, a stronger central government. It wasn't working. And so... The Constitution Convention convened in mostly Philadelphia, and the Constitution of the United States of America was written. But every state had to ratify it. Every state had to ratify it, or there would be no United States of America. Not only did every state have to ratify it, but um, the uh, Here's the procedure in most states. For a state to ratify, they had to have a state election electing delegates. Those delegates would then vote to ratify the Constitution and send delegates to the National Constitution at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. How many of you have ever been to Independence Hall and Constitution Hall in Philadelphia? Four of you? Oh, more of you. Okay. And uh, so, uh, every state had to hold local elections. Uh, this man's for ratifying the Constitution in Virginia. This man's against it. They're in my county. So we're going to have, uh, at Williamsburg at that time, we're going to have a convening of county delegates and they're going to vote whether they're going to ratify the Constitution of the United States of America. He's against it. He wants Virginia to be a country in and of itself. He's for it. Well, if, if we're going to ratify it, I have to vote for a delegate 
like Christian, who's for it. Guess who was against it in Virginia? The Baptists. The Baptists were against the Constitution of the United States for good reason. Baptists were being whipped at whipping posts in Virginia. Baptists were in jail in Virginia. And so James Madison, who wrote much of the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, James Madison, much of the Constitution, was from Virginia. And they said, you better go home and convince your own state to ratify this because other states, Virginia was so influential, other states aren't going to ratify it if your state doesn't ratify it. So he went and he said, what's going on here? What's the problem? They said the Baptists are against it. And so many people are Baptists. They're going to elect delegates like Joe who will go and vote against it. And uh, so he went to the Baptists. Why are you against this? Our preachers are in jail. John Weatherford and others, they're in jail because they won't baptize their children. They won't get a license to preach. And our con this constitution you wrote, Mr. Uh, uh, Madison, says nothing about religious freedom or liberty. So he promised the Baptists, if you will elect delegates who will ratify this, and they'll go to, uh, to uh, Philadelphia and say, Virginia votes to ratify it. I will assure you, on my word, back then words and commitments meant something. I will assure you, on my word, that the First Amendment, boy, this was important, that this man kept his word, to the Constitution of the United States, guarantee religious liberty. And in the First Amendment, the section that guarantees that. Does anybody know the wording of that? Not the section that guarantees. It's in the First Amendment to a right to assembly. We have the right to assemble here today. You guys can say, over at the flea market this afternoon, we're going to have a special religious service and then we're going to witness to everybody. You have the right to do that. You don't have to get government permission. It, it has right to assemble. It also has freedom of the press. Does anybody know the wording? That has to do with our religious liberty. Somewhat the wording. You don't know why you're not in jail today? Yes. It says something along the lines that the government will not promote or um, deny privileges to exercising your religious freedom. Okay, along that line, that's right. Does that, that help any of you? Any of you know the exact wording? I don't. It goes something like this, though. That the government cannot establish a religion. There were people who wanted to establish three or four official religions. All the other religions don't count. And Baptist didn't count. They wanted the Anglican Church, Presbyterian Church, and I forget the other, the third one. And uh, th we're going to have to fit into those categories. But it says that the government will not establish a religion or prohibit the worship or free exercise thereof, something like that. So if you want to have a prayer meeting this afternoon to pray against abortion, the government can't stop you. It's in our Constitution. They said, you'll do that? He said, I'll do that. A Baptist preacher named John Leland and a couple others traveled with him in Virginia, county to county to county to county. And he promised in every county, I'll keep my word. I'll keep my commitment. Uh, if, if Virginia will vote for this, the First Amendment to the Constitution will guarantee freedom of religion. Are you glad of that? Wow. What the, the freedom that we have to worship and outreach governmentally comes from that. Well, God told me to do it. I'd do it anyway. Wait a minute. Yeah, but you got to be willing to go to jail if it's illegal. You have to be willing to be beaten if it's illegal. You have to be willing to be put to death if it's illegal. But we're free. We're free, you see. So, Baptists not only held the Catholics at bay from the Mississippi River all the way west by evangelism, getting people saved. It wasn't political rallies. It was getting people saved, born again. But, Baptists are the ones who convince the voters to elect, by the way, ladies, I am sorry, 
women weren't allowed to vote at that time. You know about women's suffrage, right? Yeah. Women weren't allowed to vote for, I think, over 150 years of our country's existence. Uh, but, anyways, uh, to elect uh, men, elect men who would go to Williamsburg, vote, ratify the Constitution, send delegates to Philadelphia to ratify the Constitution. Once other states saw that Virginia was willing to do it, they fell in line, and they did it, uh, and uh, we live in a free country today because God not only used non-Baptists like the only Billy Sunday, but God used Baptists. And you know, Presbyterians know their heritage. We're from John Calvin. Lutherans know where they came from, Mark Luther. Um, Methodists know where they came from, the Wesleyans, Whitfield, Wesley, Asbury. Uh, we Baptists need to thank God for using our forefathers. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to carry the torch. And so make sure you're dedicated to that. Uh, I have heard, I believe, from every one of you, I believe, that God's called you, maybe every one but one, Maybe everyone. That God's called you into full-time ministry. Amen. The callings of God are without repentance. That never changes. Amen. When you're called, God wants you to get qualified. Where does it say that? Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Then you believe I'm backslidden if I don't finish a four-year degree? That's not the end of it. <laughs> Man, I was studying this morning. That's not the end of it. That's the foundation of it. That's not the end of it. Get that and keep on going. Why? To show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's, uh, let's praise God. And then uh, uh, when I say amen, Brother Evan, you can shut this off. Uh, just look ahead, by the way. One week, though. A week from today is a big day. Amen. Oh, you're, you're excited about it. What is it? Is it your birthday? No, that's, what? That's the week after. Oh! Graduation. Everybody take note of that. <laughs> Graduation! Graduation. Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you would work and help us to be like Jonathan Peck, Isaac McCoy, uh, Jonathan Going and other men who are nameless to us. Three men couldn't be done by themselves. John Leland, Lord, other men and women who carried the gospel, who carried the gospel, who carried the gospel, which gave us our great Christian Bible ethic in this country that you honored for so many years, for you said righteousness exalted the nation. Thank you for men like Better and Beller and others who wrote down this, these histories. Thank you for that. God, thank you for the missionaries that were sent out from our country during that time. Men like Adniram Judson, uh, Luther Rice. Thank you for people like that. God, help us to do our part. The torch has been passed to us. Help us to do our part and not to quit on you and your calls, for they're without repentance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.